that's my whole practice. That's all why I do all the meditation and stuff. Is like I try. I'm just trying not to do mad at people anymore. <laughs> that's, that's an that's an attractive proposition for a lot of veterans. <laughs> <laughs> Highly effective because there's so many people to be mad at, and especially like I'm a I'm a West Coaster. I came from Washington State, you know, and then coming to the East Coast and seeing seeing how everybody is tightly wound. And, uh, and wanting to get back to a little bit of the West, bring a little bit of the West coast mentality to the East coast. Good luck. Yeah. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Very good. Very good. So, um, let's back up a little bit. So I make make sure we get everything. Um, I think I asked you how many, how many operations that did you do and how many deployments did you do as a seal? Yeah. Six, six. Um, how many operations did I do? I, I got to look on the write up. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, I led 40 uh, DA missions, is what it's. Oh, oh, it says over 40, whatever that means. You know how. <laughs> a lot. The answer is a lot. You're very yeah. experienced in what you do. I got to tell you, man. Uh, and, and that it just, man, I got to tell you, like, as a SEAL, I was average on everything on the seal scale, right? I was average. I was like your average shooter. I wasn't the best shooter. I wasn't the best runner. I wasn't the worst, you know, um, in anything except my personal life, to be quite honest with you. (laughs) But uh, I like to drink and fight, man. Sorry. You know, uh, (laughs) and I was, I felt like I was born in the wrong time, um, you know, a lot. But uh, What, what what time would you think that you should have been born in? Oh man. Well, it was probably carryover from previous lives. Uh, Viking era would have been great. Mm. You know, that's kind of my heritage is uh, Northern Germanic, you know, uh, barbarian type thing. Solid choice. Yeah. So that's where I kind of came from, you know. You call yourself an average seal, right? But you're still a seal. Um, but you know, you're, you're you're also a seal with two bronze stars with valor. Um, I also read that you you earned a purple heart as well. Yeah, uh, the 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 enemy marksmanship medal. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that was that was from a roadside IED in Iraq. But so basically, um, so I, I I learned about the seal teams while I was EOD, and then. Um, I knew I had this knowing, right, um, that if I got the opportunity to go to SEAL training, that I'd make it. It was just like this internal thing. I know that sounds – it may sound egotistical or something like that, but it was just – if anybody out there has experienced that, where you kind of know something, it, 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 where you're kind of being urged down a path, um, mm-hmm. I always had that connection because in my childhood, I, my grandmother raised me Baptist and these types of things, but I've always had this, and I always saw the hypocrisy of religion, right? Uh, for me, this is, uh, now remember anybody out there listening to this, this is my experience. I'm not like projecting, you know, this is my experience. This isn't my belief. This is my experience. Okay. My experience. That's why you're here, man. That's why you're here. Yeah. Just, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor, truly. And uh, so, so my experience was is is that while religion held some, you know, there there are these truths within the religion, man's embodiment of those truths and the way that they use those truths to harness and control other people's beliefs, isn't the best way wasn't the best way for me to have an experience of those truths. Right. Gotcha. Uh, Basically, as I went along, I kind of cut out the middleman, you know, and, and I started to, you know, using tools and techniques that I found as a child in prayer of how I would connect to God and, and, you know, to varying success of that throughout my years of extreme loneliness and, and searching and ex, no, excruciating pain, um, uh, that, uh, that I understand, uh, children and teenagers go through. 
especially in the case of repeated abuse and, and these types of things. And there's a big stamp of irony on that that I'll get to here in a minute that occurred this year, actually. Um, uh, awesome. You know, with, with my son, you know, and um, I always had that connection, right? And so through that connection, I, I when I originally joined the military, I went into EOD and I found my own reasons for doing it. And I kind of made it, faked it till I made it because I really didn't know my ass from a hole in the ground. And I was just like going, well, all right, I'm going down this. I'm doing this because why am I, I needed some sort of a reason why I was doing it. And, you know, for me, it was, it was, I wanted to, as I grew in strength and, um, you know, in, in physical strength as you know, my maturity came on and I started to learn how to fight and these types of things. And I, I, I wanted to be a shield for people that couldn't protect themselves. It just kind of became that. Right. Um, and, and so I had this overly developed sense of justice, um, and which I don't, which is an oxymoron, right? I don't feel like you can really have an overly developed sense of justice, uh, because, uh, and, and what that did is that kind of that, that sense of justice, um, uh, it was basically the kindling for, you know, the powder kegs of explosives that, uh, you know, I experienced throughout the years. Right. Because I had this conviction of right and wrong and, and it was of course, uh, egregiously, um, violated on, uh, across the board through, you know, you know, the way I perceive, you know, right and wrong and, and the way that people would just, you know, breach those, those, uh, code of ethics, you know, while preaching those code of ethics, the hypocrisy of it was just bred in me, this constant source of frustration and anger, right. Mm -hmm. Of, of this world that I'm living in with no real tools on how to deal with that. So what do I do? Well, I'm going to go and I'm going to stop people. You know, I'm going to point this arrow at, at this type of uh, trajectory and I'm going to be the best fighter. I'm going to be the best, you know, I, I want to be the strongest, um, you know, the best drinker I can be. You know, I want to be the most respected guy in the EOD detachments and these types of things. A hundred percent all at all times. You want to go a hundred percent full board. Yes. No matter what it was. All of it. All yeah. of it. Why is the rum always empty? <laughs> yeah. You know, so thank you, Jack Sparrow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a true thing. Yeah, that was my thing, Rome. So, so you know, that was that was it, right? And and so I created this persona that I moved through, you know, the community with. And but at the end of the day, even with that, I was really good at the actual job, mm-hmm. you know, which was you know, being a janitor for, you know, everybody else that's having fun, to be quite honest, you know, like the guys dropping bombs on islands, you know, we get to go clean up the ones that didn't, didn't go off. You know, we, we're, we're the ones that go and, you know, clean out the IEDs of the guys that, you know, left them around or the landmine, or the aircrafts that coming back to the aircraft carrier, the stuff didn't launch off the, what it goes on and on. Yeah. But, yeah. but sometimes, you got to do some really cool work where you go get rid of something that washed up on the beach and was going to hurt some kids, you know, or, you know, the, the those were the moments, right. That made yeah. everything so worthwhile for me, you know, yeah. and, um, doing good for some, someone else. Yeah. And that's the thread. All right. So that's the beginning of the thread as I started to experience those things. And it, it was, it was the connect at the end of the day, it was the connection between myself God and the people that I was doing it for. And so as things progressed, I found that my personality was much more in alignment with those of the SEALs, you know, um, sure. in, infinitely more. And uh, I finally got my shot and I made it through first time. Um, and uh, it was, it was for me, like SEAL training, the BUDS piece was yeah, it's challenging, but it was it paled in comparison to the challenges that I'd face after. Like it was, yeah, yeah. That's what anybody thinking about they were going to go into the SEAL teams or anything for. Uh, just understand that training is the easy part. You know, seriously, like seriously, that's, that's not the, even that's the, that's the that's, prep you for the hard stuff. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Just just so, to be, just to get you used to feeling of the the feeling of being uncomfortable. 
not even used to it so much as 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 weeding out the people that can't endure it because I don't know that you ever get used to it. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? It's just like you, you just go. You know what I mean? Yeah. You go and you focus your mind and you do your thing. You know, and then uh, and you get better at you get better at navigating it, of course. You know, but uh, and then you become something different altogether. You know, and there's periods of times where you kind of look forward to when it's like that, you know, and then when it's taken away from you and it's no longer like that, then you're something different and you don't know how to be in the space that's not like that. Absolutely. If that makes sense. So the way I've seen you talk about SEAL teams in some of your interviews, the men you served with, uh, that career, that aspect of your life, the amount of reverence that you speak of it. It made me think of a previous interview I did with, uh, he, he was a former CEO of mine uh, at, the, at one of my schoolhouses, Danny Chung, and he's now the, the chief of staff for Microsoft Military Affairs. He said that even though it's been over 10 years since he's left the military, he doesn't feel that he's fully transitioned into like civilian Danny. Do you, do you have that same sentiment? You are bringing up the core of what I teach to veterans through the nonprofit Vital Warrior. Absolutely. Uh, but but there's a reason for that, and I'll go into that. So we absolutely have to put a pin in that because it's a critical piece. Absolutely. Um, but when I joined the mil- uh, joined into the uh, when I went into the SEAL teams, you know, um, you know, I, I still even even in the SEAL teams, I had I had problems with you know fighting and these types of things. Believe it or not, because would just spark up out, out in town. You know what I mean? Mm. And, uh, so over time I started to get better and, uh, and, you know, started focusing in these types of things. And, um, you know, is at the beginning of the, um, the beginning of my career in the SEAL teams, you know, I had problems with alcohol and these types of things. And, you know, um, I didn't have problems with alcohol, you know, what would, you know, the, the, it just happened that, that, you know, all this really unfortunate stuff would happen when I drank, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just a coincidence. It's all just a coincidence. <laughs> so, so after, after smacking myself against the concrete on that, um, over and over and over again, I finally was like, you know what, maybe I just shouldn't drink, you know, this is causing all this hate and discontent. Uh, let's just like stop, you know? Yeah. And so I started moving in that direction. And, uh, so, uh, we were in Germany, you know, that's when we did the Bosnia, um, the, the Kosovo thing, the Kosovo thing. And, um, you know, that was fun. And then, and then nine 11 happened and, you know, gearing up for all that and, you know, deploying, you know, we initially were doing the, um, you know, I was a, I was the shift leader for the deputy prime minister through the interim, uh, democratic elections and all these types of things, you know, 300, you know, three different nations trying to kill this guy and, and, you know, (laughs) doing a mission set that, you know, wasn't necessarily the seal mission set you know, and, but we crushed it, you know, we did a really good job and it's more department of state and CIA and all that stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it, it was great, you know, like, yeah. yeah, to put this in perspective, you know, for a break, we'd go over to buy app and we do direct action missions. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was our, that was our reward for doing a good job. You know, so wow. during one of those missions we were coming back from an op and, and uh, a roadside IED, uh, went off on my vehicle, low ordered, low ordered. And, um, I didn't know it at the time. I just thought it like, like it knocked me out and I'm, I'm, I'm like sitting there and it didn't even down the vehicles. It threw like quarter size hole. It was like Pulp Fiction, you know, where the guy busts out and he's like blasting off all those rounds and they're looking around and like nobody's hit. Yeah. This is a divine intervention, you know? So, <laughs> so it was like that because it, this thing was packed. The back was packed full of, uh, Iraqi soft. The internals were packed like, and there was like these quarter size hole through the breacher blankets and nobody got hit. Wow. You know, other than me, I was in the turret and I, the, the shockwave of it, uh, got a hold of me and it, um, Jeez. and so, 
it caused uh, severe cervical trauma um, years later. You know, they said it was fractured. Who knows? But, um, you know, MTBI, ulnar nerve damage, all these types of things. To be quite honest, I think that was just an amalgamation of different things, close proximity explosives as a breacher and all these types of things that, that just, you know, kind of combined. Yeah. I mean, like it, it, the cost of doing business, right? Um, yeah. Did these injuries play a factor of you getting out? Oh, yeah, that's that's absolutely. Um, so, you know, fast forward to uh, the second tour to Iraq. That's one of those career, like, you know, is Jocko was out doing Ramadi and we were, you know, the, the sister platoon, so to speak, of uh, not sister platoon, but um, the, the, the other entity in Iraq doing, uh, we were doing tier one hits, you know, with, uh, in conjunction with CAG and these types of things. So, uh, it was, it was, um, you were left team. He was right team. Exactly. Speaking of, speaking of Jocko and, and, and some other people that, that you served with while you were in, uh, can you either give me your best friend or your greatest mentor? Ooh, well, I didn't have a lot of, I had, I had very few friends right? Like mm-hmm. I wouldn't, I, I don't use that term lightly. Um, sure. but my mentor would be, uh, Fran Rogers. He was a master chief that served with my father and, uh, he stayed in 30 years and, uh, he was a, he was a profound mentor for me. Um, Pete Poulian was another one, uh, that I was highly respected, uh, both master chiefs, right? Um, gotcha. if we were looking at an officer, Peluso, would be uh, one of my uh, one of the officers that I respected the most. He was fantastic, and uh, you know, uh, Jocko. I, I, I respect Jocko as well. He was my skipper uh, when I was at uh, Trade Ed at the end. Uh, he was West Coast guy. I was East Coast. So, uh, and then and then lastly, uh, a really big one. Uh, the guy, a guy that was, um, you know, instrumental. And uh, at near the end of my uh, career in the Navy uh, was Master Chief Lindell, and um, he was he was paramount in helping me to find my path uh, in this new world I'm in now. So, gotcha, very good. What was uh, what, if you were to pick out one thing that maybe one of these mentors taught you, what would it have been? Uh, well, Fran, Fran always kept my connection going like whenever i fran was there and and helped me to uh remember my connection to god at all times mm. so that was that was they're all for different reasons man you know so mm. it's like of course absolutely of course yeah. some, and, are, some are technical mentors some are spiritual mentors some are you know, it's interesting how I had all of them, right? You know, uh, yeah. Jocko was the physicality, freaking, uh, you know, Lindell was the uh, protector of the path, you know, and and just how to be as a human uh, uh, above average, you know, experience, you know, all these types of things, kind of a trifecta of, of, teachers and mentors that came into my life to make me, uh, who I am today. You know, that's outstanding. The most common years I see, you know, when I, folks leave the military is, is either four years or, or 20 or 30, uh, 20, 22 years in 22 years is, is kind of an odd year. Mm. Is there a story by behind 22? It's interesting, right? 22 is an interesting number and it wasn't quite 22 is just before 22, but we can, if you look at the regular number system, we round up, don't we? So they say there's two paths to spiritual uh, enlightenment, right? One is isolation, you know, and others extreme pain. And I chose B for some damn reason. <laughs> <laughs> what was uh, what was going on at the time, if you don't mind me asking? So I came back from uh, my second deployment. Uh, my second combat deployment, my, my sixth yeah. deployment. Um, and, uh, I, I couldn't sleep for four days at a pop. I was, I was getting into a situation where I couldn't sleep for four days at a pop. Didn't know what was going on. 
Uh, that's where they started introducing the pills. And this wasn't the VA. I'm not pointing my finger at the VA right now. In fact, the VA wasn't the ones that drugged me up. It was actually active duty when all this started. So, so do you, you were still in, this was still, I was in still in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I started getting drugged up, uh, by Balboa Naval Medical Hospital, to be quite honest with you. Uh, and, you know, and before, you know, regular Navy and these types of things and, and, and not anything, you know, I originally, you know, kind of had the thing on it where it was like this beating the war drum against pills and all these types of things. But then I realized that there is a place for that, you know, and it's just that we, we go there too quickly. You know, we, there, I've learned a lot. Uh, and there's a reason I had those experiences sure. so that I could learn, you know, so that I could learn and teach and these types of things. You've but been, you've been very, you've been very open about the dangers of, of prescription pills and only prescription pills as a, as a, or prescription pill cocktails as a one size fits all for PTS. Mm -hmm. Um, and you, and you went, you went over, you went down that road. And I, and I, I think it's safe to say that the VA heck society in general didn't know how to handle the influx of combat veterans in, in many ways. That's accurate. You know, and I've told my own personal story with the VA many times on this podcast. Uh, mine was more physical therapy related, but I walked away for four years and, you know, I finally found a, a good ther therapist when I came back through the, through the mission X community care program, uh, where I could find my own local physical therapist. But that's the, but, but that's beside the point that, you know, unfortunately our generation had to endure that those hard lessons of our society. Um, how they needed to support us coming home and coming out of the military. Yeah. However, I also think it's, I also think it's fair to say that due to veteran advocacy from many angles, as we're starting to see changes in the VA and in society. And, and now that was part of the reason I was excited to host this podcast is so I can dig into some of those changes and see what's been done. And I can let as many other veterans that I know that as many other veterans that, uh, you know, I can, I can get it out there. So that's, that's one of the reasons I, I, I enjoy this doing this podcast is so I can do that. It's fantastic. You know, it's, 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 that's a fair assessment, I think, you know, and, and you've been very open about that. And, and, you know, I think it's important to understand where this road started for you and how you got out of it. That's, that's great lead in. Um, so I actually, it's funny, man, like, uh, the, 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 the mentality around combat-related stress at the beginning was if you raise your hand for that, you're considered weak or something's wrong with you, even though other people were experiencing the same types of things. Absolutely. But if you're, you know, which is the antithesis, right? Yep. You're actually the strong guy that stands up in that crowd of scrutiny and goes, hey, something's wrong. Like something's off. You know what I mean? And um, Leadership is sometimes a lonely mountain. Yeah. I didn't look at it as leadership at the time, right? It, it, it just felt incredibly uncomfortable. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it Absolutely. Just, Absolutely. It just sucked. And, and so on top of that, right, I had to take – two weeks after I came back from combat, um, I had to take emergency custody of my son because his mother uh, abused him horribly. And, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, he was six years old. And, and, and that's wow. I was like, you know what? Something's off. I really wanted to focus on art and these types of things. And, and I couldn't get into it. And like, they destroyed my house. They flooded, like they were building out. So I had this four story condo and they flooded the whole place out while they were installing a sink and, and destroyed everything in there. So, and then nobody wanted to pay for it. I was starting to work up in another platoon and, you know, all these types of things were going on, right? All this was happening at once. Jeez. All this was happening at once and took emergency custody of my son, you know, and then when we're waiting for the hearing, his mother um, had some, some issues she was going through. She tried to commit suicide and um, while we're waiting for the hearing and then there, then the state is contemplating how they're going to give my son back to her. It's like, what, <laughs> you know, so, and then they told me, I remember, uh, this is the state of Virginia. This is how they work. Um, they're like, uh, how much were you gone last year? And I was like 10 months. And yeah. they're like, how about the year before? And, and I'm like 10 months, I see where you're going with this. And you're like, well, we don't see how it benefits your son to give you custody. If you're gone 10 months out of the year. Fair point, right? 
fair you point. know, fair point. Um, but then when I said, well, he's got a stepmother that's been in his life since he was, you know, one. Also a fair point. Yeah. But they're like, yeah, but, you know, she's she's from the Czech Republic and, you know, and there may be some language barrier stuff. And we're just, I was like, so you think it's better to put him in a home to, than to be with someone who loves him? You know, and, and they're like, that's not, and I go, I go, let me get this straight. Because I go down range, you know, to, to, to protect your way of life with my guys, you're going to put my son in a home. And she's like, that's not what I'm saying. I was like, that's exactly what you're saying. I was like, what makes you think I can go down range literally for years and kill for people that obviously don't give a And I wouldn't do a hundred times more for those closest to me. You got to understand the mentality I'm in at this time. I just came out of war, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm telling her this and you got to understand how I look. I got like this bald head. I got this big (laughs) ass mustache. I'm like 238 pounds. You're a big guy. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm like, you remember (laughs) barbarian, right? Yeah. I'm like a dude with like, and now I look like the barbarian with the flames on his back, you know? He's half on uh, fire, still swinging the ax. And, uh, and she's like, are you threatening me? And I'm like, no, you don't get it. No, I'm not. And I was like, I was like, don't worry about my job. I'll find something. My command will take care of me. I hadn't been on, I never, I never, I hadn't been on shore duty, uh, the entire time as a seal. It was going on what, eight years or something like this. Um, so yeah, you, you've been pretty acclimated to war, but not as much as, civilian it's like civility no no civility no civility really and and, but that was that was common through my life you know what i mean i was a i was a product of the experiences that i was having without understanding the why of i i was having them and and much less the 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 means of incorporating them you know and i think a lot of veterans go go through that absolutely you're not alone in that no no we are not and so so I went to my master chief. I was like, hey, here's the situation. I can put my son in a home. We we're going to deploy again in two months. Oof. And uh, I basically had to choose between two families, right? I had to choose yeah. between that dream uh, and and being a SEAL and all these types of things and all the great work that we do there and the and my blood family, right? Yeah. And so I chose blood. And... And I'm really glad I did. Well, my hat's off to you that you were able to straddle that for, for 20 years, for 22 years as it is. Well, here's the thing, brother. Um, I, I didn't do it gracefully at the end. Uh, there was a lot going on. And um, I, I took custody of my son. I was still trying to figure out how, what the hell was going on with me. I wasn't a very good father, uh, not only to that that child, but my other two children, my older two children, you know, because I was always focused on war, you know, and I was focused on doing the job that I was, that I felt like, um, because I went from the shield, I was praying to be the shield for God to being the hammer. And, and I was granted that and I got to do that. And the reward for that, and this is something you don't see. And this was the other thing that, that happens within us. And this is something that's critical. And when you go down range and you have an experience, let's say you go into a, an area and you liberate this area from terrorists, op- a cell operating in that area that where they're, they're cutting the heads off and setting them um, on the neighbor's porch saying you're next uh, and giving them time frames. And, and if you're helping the Americans or these types of things, you know, and you go in there and you remove that and you have people coming out in the streets, you know, and you engage with that person at what you just did for them. And, and that's a shared experience of life and death that cannot be comparable to anything else that I had ever experienced up to that point. The amount of satisfaction you get and the amount of confirmation, divine confirmation that that is absolutely the right thing to be doing, regardless of the reasons why we're in the country in the first place. Who, sure, who cares? Sure. You know, but down to the individual, why is it you're doing what you're doing and what 
is the payoff. And for me, the payoff was that reciprocation of that energy between the human experience. And it goes beyond the human experience into a a spiritual type of thing that can only be considered divine in my personal opinion. Then you're expected to come out of that and then what? Right. Then go go grocery shopping. Like you've got that ultimate purpose. Then what do you do? You know, and that I feel is a big piece of of a lot of our issues. You know, I think, and I know I'm talking to an EOD tech, but I think the one thing the Hurt Locker got right was. (laughs) (laughs) I I understand. um, Was I'm sorry, I didn't mean to chuckle. No, no, I get it. I get it. I get it. I've talked to a lot of EOD techs about the Hurt Locker. You're talking about the grocery store, right? The grocery store scene. Yep. Absolutely. I think if they got anything right in that whole film, it was the feeling of going grocery shopping Ugh. after after something like that. Absolutely. I agree. That's how I knew exactly what you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said, you, you've been very open about... Um, you know, your the dark path that you did land that you did land coming, you know, on your exit of of the DOD. How did it get right? How did you get off the psychoactive pills? How did you get back to where to where you are now? I was on thirteen about thirteen different medications at some point. Um that weren't working. I was going into the Balboa Naval Medical Center like twice a week talking about my stuff to some JO that's just punching a ticket for six months and, and writing up a paper and, you know, is how it felt like it was just like, it it wasn't the right one for you. Well, no, it was a number of them. You know, that's the thing is it kept changing. Mm. Yeah. I went through a whole bunch of them doing the same thing and I saw the pattern, you know? So it's like, man, it is a training command. You know what I mean? So I get it. I get it. I'm in the military. That's part of the thing. So, I remember I, I, I started having this uh, self-diagnosed, you know, pharmaceutical-induced cardiac arrest. And I say self-diagnosed because nobody else was there. But uh, I was walked out and I could feel my heart pounding. And I was like, Ugh. and I went and I, and I, the students came running up to me. I was on the island and the students came running up to me. He's chief, you look gray, you know, and I was like, and I felt death, right? I felt mm. death and I was like, and, and I got to tell you, it, 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 I, I was, it was the first time I felt peace in years. The amount of peace I felt, I was like, finally, finally, it was like, finally, you know, this is over. And that's scary. It wasn't scary. No, it wasn't scary, but, but, but being close to death is what finally gave you peace. That's scary. That's yeah. a scary thought. Yeah. And, and, and I didn't die. And that's when yeah. I really truly understood the meaning of the word fury. You know, uh, that's the first time I truly experienced it. Everything else was rage, anger, but fury at, at the people that were supposed to be trying to help were killing me is what I felt. And, and the situation that I was in and why am I in this situation and, and, and how did I get here and these types of things. Right. So what that did was it, that elicited a series of events where I revolted against the system. You know, I was like, I am no, and this is where the master chief James Lindell came into play. So critically is that, um, one, just overall teaching me how to be a better human, but two, um, you know, this, this, uh, he sheltered, he saw that and he afforded me the opportunity to, to explore it, grow it and become it. And so basically I was being medically discharged, uh, due to the injuries that I had neurosurgery in 2009, because, you know, stack one more thing up there, neurological symptoms showed up. Uh, I was taking hard rights while I was getting out of chairs, you know, into the ground, you know, I was, um, because of vestibular issues. And then, um, and then like, I, I lost all my grip strength in my right hand and, uh, you know, I had to use my back to lift my arm type stuff. And, so you're physically, 
and the mine at the same yeah, time. Yeah, it's like, what the hell is going on? So they went in, did some a lot of testing. They, they went in and basically the, the, uh, the fracture had uh, closed off my C5, C6 nerve roots. And, and they had to go in there and dremel out the space. And once they did, though, it was good to go, you know, like, like that, that aspect of it was good. There was still a lot of pain management. You know, I was still in a lot, I'd like get migraines really bad in these types of things, which still occur from time to time. So, um, gotcha. but they're getting better and better. So, um, now what year was this? Did you, did you, did you leave? Uh, 2009 was neurosurgery. Gotcha. So when, when, when did you get your final? So I was being medically discharged in 2012. However, after 2009 in that whole, you know, revolt thing started happening. I started seeking out things that made me feel better. I wanted to take things into my own hand. I was getting off those pills. I knew they were no good. Sure. Uh, I kind of white knuckled through that, which I highly recommend you do with a, a doctor that supports you getting off of those pills because uh, I had some events that were like, like crazy uh, mental types of disturbances getting off of those pills and um so have have support have support titrate off of them you know it takes time i got like these brain buzzes where like it would like it was just those things uh, uh, we've we've got to explore every other option than those pills before we 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 look at those things you know yeah don't just don't but what you're trying to say is don't go cold turkey on your own don't go cold turkey on your own and explore other options before you do it. You have to, like you have to, you have to. But so, so as I'm going through this process, I was asked um, by another mentor, you know, another uh, Vietnam era seal, Harry Humphreys. Uh, and, um, you know, he was my mentor in the creative world and, and just how to navigate things and how to be on set and all these types of things. And so he had been working um, a small known franchise called Transformers. Tiny, tiny. <laughs> of fact, we had a guy. We ha- we have a, a former guest uh, in our archives who ran the social media account for Megatron during that time. That's funny. I didn't even know Megatron had a social media account. That's crazy. He had his own MySpace with over with over five hundred thousand followers. That's funny. And it was a veteran that was behind that account. That's cool. That's cool. You might know Mark Harper. He's president CEO of We Are the Mighty out there in LA. Uh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. know him. They actually did a number of articles on uh, you know stuff that I've had going on. So yep. um, they've been a great advocate as well. Very good, very good. Um, so so I was asked to be on this thing, right? And uh, you got to understand, I have all of those things going on. As I, I'm like, yeah, sure, that sounds exciting. That sounds like it'll be fun. Ba 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 ba. Yeah. Well, I got there and you remember how I looked, 230 plus pounds now, like 230, 250, 60, because I was in metabolic syndrome and uh, I started gaining weight for no reason and it was crazy. Um, And uh, Michael Bay comes over and he's like, whoa, what the hell do they call you? And I'm like, (laughs) and I go, hooch. That was my nickname, Hooch. Hooch. <laughs> and uh, he's like, "Oh, perfect." He goes, "He goes, do you want to be an actor?" And I was like, "Yes, sir." And he goes, "Okay, come here." He goes, "So at this point, you were ju- you were background talent." I was background, a special ability extra. Wow. And, okay. Yeah, I was a coke can in the background. Gotcha. And he goes, Very he good. Goes, hey, he goes, "Hey, you want to be an actor?" And I was like, "Yes, sir." And he goes, "He goes, okay, come here." And he's like, "Wait a minute, wait, can you act?" And I go. <laughs> You're the director. Don't you have to be the judge of that? (laughs) And he's like, fair enough. All right. Here's what you're going to do. And I remember they started putting the mic on me. He's telling me what I'm doing. And I look on this. It's $60,000 an hour set. And I don't know if you remember Transformers 3, but it's the. Okay. So there's this skyscraper that's fallen over when this giant, you know. um, Is that when like the worm Uh, thing is kind of wrapping around? Yeah, yeah, like it's it's shockwaves attacking the the building and he sends his pet up there to crush the the pillars and stuff like that. And that's what's happening, right? So I'm the bald dude that's, uh, you know, with the big mustache and the rocket launcher and all that stuff. I I remember that very well. You know, so so you went from a background actor to that. You know, you had a lot of speaking roles in that film. I did. And here's the why. So, and this is a funny story that you don't get to see. If you notice- in that particular scene, 
you see me lean out of the building and then I look back over my shoulder and I say, they're shooting at the building. Well, that's not the original line. <laughs> I remember I was standing there, they're micing me up and, and then I, and then I felt like somebody was choking me out. And, and I remember them going action and what he wanted me to do was run down to the end and look like I was freaked out and, and, and nervous and all these things. And I did that really well. But then I said the wrong words. <laughs> He's like, oh. you wanted, the original words were the building's teetering, you know? And, uh, and then, and then I look out and I go, the building's tiltering. Ah! And uh, he's like, cut, you can't say that. I, I said an inappropriate word afterwards. He goes, you can't say that word. It's a kid's show. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I did it again. And then, you know, like, like I remember, and this is, this is a critical point, and this ties back into the combat thing. So what has happened is, so I'm sitting there and, and I'm walking down the street. You got to remember, I've got blood on me. I'm super soaked. They call me hooch for a reason because this chemical reaction kind of happens in my mouth when I run really hard and it like, like, <laughs> you know, the got dog it. off a Turner and hooch. Yep, 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 like, yep, that's yep, how I got it. the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. That, like you could tie your shoes with this stuff. Um, oh my gosh. So I'm sitting there and, and I, I remember about a hundred meters away, they got everybody blocked so they can't come into the set and obviously, but there's huge crowds. And I remember seeing this little kid and I remember seeing him and our eyes lock and he stiffens up and he grabs his mom's pant leg and he's shaking it and, and he's like, looks up at her and he looks back at me like, is he looking at me? And I lean down and I point both fingers at him. I'm like, you, and he's like, oh. <laughs> And he like looks and he grabs his mom. He's like, look, look, look. And I start walking over to him, right? And the closer I get, the more dumbstruck, like, like this kid's just like, oh, like, like the second coming of Christ is happening, right? Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and, and I grab him and I pick him up and he's just like looking at me. I look over at his mom and she's like crying. You could tell like they, they probably like, lived out of a car because they were really dirty and like, you know, his, their father breaks out this wind up camera and they're like, can we, they have a heavy accident. And they're like, hey, can we take a picture? And you're not supposed to take pictures. And I look at the kid and I'm like, you're not gonna put this on your Facebook page, are you? Mm. And he's like, he's just like staring. And I got to tell you that experience, it hit like a lightning bolt. And it was, it was the, the understanding of purpose in the creative space. So before I told you about liberating that town where I first time I felt that sense of purpose, that profound sense of divine purpose, but that was on, that was on the spectrum of destruction. This was the, it, it was equivocal and it was in the realm of creation that I can use creation creativity to have that same type of connection and purpose. And very that good. was a very, it, that was a critically profound experience as I'm engaged with this, these people and that sharing of that purpose. And that's why I do what I do in film and television. That is the why, is to have that type of connection. Now, multiply that from what I've learned through this study of this warrior-based meditation system. And now we're really talking about an acceleration of purpose, right? Um, so much so that that it, it it prompted me to form Vital Warrior, which is a nonprofit organization centered around the cultivation of a creative force within oneself using these these uh, warrior based principles in meditation, breathing, and and posture to to elicit a creative response within oneself that that creates a projection that can actually shape others around them that's it that's what i do that's what this nonprofit's about and there's other things to to kind of amplify uh that effect that support it you know with getting the bot dealing with pain management helping to increase focus you know relaxing injury and 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 just bringing things back around and you know 
and making things available. Um, the biggest piece, obviously, the foundation of which is this uh, is this lineage of you know through the Rama Institute uh, here in Los Angeles and and the the veterans program that we've set up that you guys shared the blog about and what we offer you know uh, on a streaming platform is uh, you know tools and techniques that men and women can use that that will help create their specific. Uh, understanding of the why they were given life's experiences. The biggest thing that that I feel that we needed to learn, that I needed, was to for somebody to teach me how to interpret what's going on inside my head and what my experiences are for myself, to experience that myself, not not go to somebody and talk about something and and have them use the filter of their experiences and learnings to then tell me what is going on inside my own head, but to, to, to teach me how to figure that out myself. And this has been the fastest method of doing that. Gotcha. So you, you started this, this nonprofit vitalwarrior.org doing some research. You do a lot of, you do, you do a lot of work with veterans and, and veterans can come into it. Did you say that that's streaming now? It absolutely is. And uh, we had uh, 500 veterans after your post. Thank you. so. I'm so grateful to the VA for hosting us on that platform. 500 yeah. veterans reached out to us uh, with interest in, in what we're doing. 500 awesome. from one post. You know, the vet resources and, and what they do with the with the email newsletter, they, they do amazing things. It goes up to about 12 million veteran email accounts, you know, mm. through a newsletter. So It's so, incredible. Yeah. So that's, that's one of the things that we do at the podcast is it, it goes in that newsletter every week and it goes out to the entire, if you've signed up for, for VA services, it goes to your email account unless you opt out of it. But it, right, as it stands right now, it's about 12 million email accounts. Wow. Which is fantastic. You know, that's what we need. You know, that's what we're about. And yeah. you know, the ultimate goal is to, to reach out uh, beyond a streaming platform. We want to have brick and mortar facilities to, um, to give some options and take up load where the VA may not be able to uh, provide, right? And in the space of approaching meditation um, and stress and these types of things from a warrior's perspective, and, and giving these men and women tools and techniques to understand that stress, physiologically, the body does not care where the stress comes from. It could be combat. It could be, you know, extreme service oriented uh, professions or high stress environments for prolonged periods of time are going to have a replicable physiological effect on the body. And we can reverse that if we understand the mechanics involved. Now you're talking about now, now Vata Warrior, is that, is that yoga? Is that mental wellness? Like what, what, what do you, as an acupuncture, what, what kind of alternative therapies uh, does Vata Warrior offer? Okay. So right now what we are, okay. So it's all based on things that I used in my own uh, progression that have been in your own journey, in, in, all of them, every, every single thing that we offer. I have experienced personally to have efficacy in moving that proverbial ball down the field. I read the news releases from the VA every week uh, on the podcast. And, and, you know, I, I, I'm seeing a lot of different things that the VA is starting to support, like supporting local homeless and local sports therapy nonprofits, um, seeing a lot of different uh, alternative strategies and, and wellness uh, with the, with the live whole health stuff. We have, we have meditation videos on our YouTube channel now, you know, I don't know if anybody, anybody knows that, but with, you know, I, I like seeing different therapies that 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 work for different people, and it sounds like you've you've experienced a lot of the a lot of this. Absolutely, and this particular, I've tried a lot of different things, a lot yeah. of different things, putting this whole thing together, and this has been by far the absolute most powerful, um, most uh, replicable of any type of system that I've tried that's out there. I don't want anybody to believe me. I want them to experience for themselves. So I don't work in beliefs. I work, I, I work in experiences and yeah. that's what this system is. It's mental disciplines within the warrior ethos. And when I say warrior, I don't necessarily mean a war fighter. I don't mean a war fighter. I mean a warrior. We're all in a war. And we're in a war for control of our own minds and ascertain 
to ascertain the truth of what is real for us, the why we've experienced what we've experienced, to gain the ability to incorporate those experiences instead of trying to get back to where we were before they occurred. We're given in life's experiences to gain strength so that we can carry on towards our true purpose. Everything else is just preparation. I, 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 I'm just talking what I've experienced. Yeah, you know what I mean? no, absolutely. You know, there's absolutely. a lot of skepticism around it, but I'm telling you, this stuff is real. Well, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an alternative strategy that, that, you know, it definitely works for some people that, that go on that journey. Absolutely. Absolutely. There, and there's different strategies for different people. But at the end of the day, it's about getting your entire health, you know, your values and aspirations, your mental, your physical, spiritual, all that. Now, I, I personally haven't gotten too deep into it, but, um, you know, uh, I think, you know, like I said, with the VA has the, has the live whole health, which kind of digs a lot of into the, digs a lot into that, including yoga, meditation, a lot of different alternative therapies. So is there a one, one stop shop for everyone? No, but, but, and, and is the VA's solution perfect? Is, is anybody's solution perfect? No, I, for everyone? No, it's, and, and, but I think the VA, I like, I, and I like hearing about different alternative strategies because, you know, and I like incorporating a lot of this into the VA and, and seeing a lot of that. Uh, you know, the, the VA is a big ship and tidy, tiny rudder. Sometimes it takes a lot to. <laughs> That's a great. I've, n- I've never heard that one, man. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Uh, uh, but it's but it's just like any other Fortune 500 company, any other department level. You know, any think about the Navy, think about the the Marine Corps. Um, but it's the only VA we got, right? And I think I think we just need to bring our our own experiences, our own skills, to make it better for all of us who who have put the uniform down. You know, and I, and I appreciate your experience, your your skills, your journey. That's why I brought you on here because I think many share or have shared your story during those growing pains that you've had. But many communities, like 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 I talked about earlier, that have had to deal with the sudden influx of veterans, uh, you know, medical, private industry, all of it. Uh, you know, they can learn for from everybody's journey. Absolutely, and um, that's the whole that's the whole thing. I'm not the same person. Now you got to understand. Um, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't born Mikhail Vega. I had a legal name change. Um, my first name is a contraction of swim buddy that was killed in Iraq, you know, uh, Michael Koch. And, uh, he, he was killed, uh, during a room entry in Iraq. And, uh, um, the other thing I want to bring up, and, and this is a testament to this type of practice uh, and, and what this practice is, this is a science-based practice. This isn't a religion thing. So if you, if you do religion, that's fine. You know, whatever your belief system is, that's fine. You know, this makes whatever it is you're doing better. It's all based on breathing, you know, sound, these types of things to get certain glandular secretions of the brain going so that you can balance your blood chemistry and have an experience of joy. You know, bring yourself into and and use tools and techniques to, to take the edge off of things that may be replicating in your life in a non-productive manner. This is why it's the foundation of Vital Warrior. Some of the, you asked about some of the other things that we incorporate. Um, there's acupuncture, myofascial release, uh, rolfing. I'm not sure if you, do you know what rolfing is? No. So no. rolfing is uh, the same as torture, except they don't ask you any questions. <laughs> I was going to ask you, is it the same as Ralphine? Uh, you know. <laughs> no. Okay. What, what they do is they anchor. So you have fascia, which is, fascia, which is a, a system that runs through the body that supports the muscles. And think of it as like a sheath that the muscle slides inside, right? If you crack okay. open an orange and it holds the form of the muscle, right? So if okay. you crack open an orange, the white stuff in an orange, that's fascia. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, so overuse or injury or, you know, that this fascia can adhere to the muscle in the form of scar tissue, right? And so the muscle can't flex all the way or how it should. So what they do is they, they use an elbow or the, uh, or they anchor it somehow and they have you flex the muscle and tear the scar tissue. That sounds um, a lot like what happens to my shoulder. Um, yeah. I, I do what's called trigger point therapy. Oh, that's good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, there's a lot of similarities, but uh, mm. the Rolfing thing is is kind of set up for the whole body, and uh, because they don't believe that like one area is is the cause of the problem, it's how the whole body's aligned, you know, that causes causes the, so they address it in a tin system, and okay. do like tin a series of tins is what they call it, and and 
mm. or something along those lines. And then they, and you go through 10 sessions of uh, joy. Uh, but the effects, <laughs> the effects completely realign the body, like seriously, and, and Interesting. get rid of years of chronic pain. So, uh, and then there's acupuncture, myofascial release. Uh, the uh, I use flotation therapy. You know, Joe Rogan made that really popular yep. where you float yep. in the isolation tanks. Yep. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's TRE, tension release exercises that I, I'm a level two instructor in that or facilitator of that. Um, and, uh, you know, all of these things that we want to make under one roof and I want to kind of make it and then jujitsu, but the art of the art of the martial art, not, not trying to like just destroy somebody, but, but, you know, getting into this flow state of, uh, kind of like a meditative type of practice in the art. If you think of it more, if we can bring that kind of Tai Chi mentality to, uh, jujitsu, uh, I, I, I is is kind of what I endeavor to do as and the, well. And the, and the martial uh, art in, in and of itself will just improve your flexibility, and there's so many good physical uh, benefits as well. You know, it's all a matter of perspective, right? If we approach it from that way, yes, it can do that. But if we get a guy that's like, you know, in a fear-based system, or you know, I want to conquer this person, uh, then you could do a lot of damage. You know, you can. So, so we we come at it from a different. Uh, uh, which, which actually will increase your abilities uh, infinitely more um, fast. So we've been using chiropractic care uh, just free of charge, like, like um, just helping, helping with the load uh, for the VA there. You know, that's, yeah. that's how I always envisioned Vital Warrior being. Uh, originally, I was – uh, and uh, I was, I didn't want to go anywhere near the VA because I had this thing stuck in my head that, that they're going to try to put me on pills right away. You know what I mean? Yeah. Cause you had that experience with the, with the DOD. Absolutely. Yes. So, so yeah. that was my experience. That's, that's a natural and, reaction, uh, you know? And then over time I learned that wasn't the case and, you know, and, and I, I, I kind of relax those things and, and I understand the the main thing is just the irresponsible stuff that, that we can get into. Not just across the board, it, we, we, as humans, you know, we want to turn to a pill far too quickly. You know, we want a quick fix, you know, but, um, rarely do I find people, uh, that will actually sit down and, and engage in something that will give them a, a lasting type of, uh, experience of progression and having a better life because it takes responsibility and hard work. Yeah. Um, to, to incorporate those things, to understand from experience, to let go of habitual patterns um, that this stuff will bring to light. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And you heard my story. This yeah. is the hardest work I've ever done in my life. Um, and, and it's because you got to think of this thing as a martial art against your own mind or for your own mind, I should say. I can definitely see that. Very good. Uh, now, going back to your your film career a little bit. I noticed in your acting credits, you've done a lot of roles where it looks like you can draw on some of your military experience, uh, both in, in physical and emotional ways. Is that, is that a technique of yours or like drawn on your own history? Uh, I think that's every actor's technique, whether they consciously do that or not. Sure. I don't see how, how it cannot be. Right. I think that, um, the, any actor brings the breadth of their, uh, life experience to whatever character, uh, they portray and that's their filter, you know, yeah. and, you know, and, and I think the degree of the, the compelling performances that you see across the spectrum is all interdependent on how well they're able to tap into that. Absolutely. I completely understand that. Um, I also noticed that unlike, uh, unlike many military veterans in LA, uh, technical advising isn't what dominates your credits, it, mainly acting credits. Uh, now you did that for NBC's The Brave. Was it, what was it like to to go back into the military instructor role? Because I know you did that as a SEAL and was that fun for you? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I had been working consistently as an actor when I was approached to do that tech advising role. Yeah. And, uh, some of the people that I was involved with at the time there, I was, they were like, they want me to be a tech advisor. I don't want to be a tech advisor. Yeah. Why don't you put me in the thing? Like, look at the script. <laughs> Why am I not in it? And, uh, 
And that's one of the things that, you know, we kind of fight in, in the veterans community. They, a lot of times they want to, they, they have a perception of us as being able to tell these, uh, being the holders of these really great stories and everything. Yeah. They don't necessarily see us as creatives uh, a yeah. lot of times. Yeah, I spoke about a lot about that with Jennifer Marshall and Dale Dye, and uh-huh. where, where they talk about yeah, you know, there there has to there's got to be a shift in in the, in the Hollywood scene a little bit in that. Absolutely, and and we're getting there, but again, this is another one of those. Uh, yeah, what, what was that you said? It was a big ship, little rudder. Yeah, tiny, so, <laughs> big ship, um, tiny rudder. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, Basically, what that all boils down to, and this is something analogous to us as veterans endeavoring to get into a creative uh, world to think about, is is that nobody's going to give you anything because you're a veteran. No, uh, you might get that they're going to get there if it comes down between you know you know a guy you're up for a role as an actor. If if you're up for a role that's a, a soldier, his past is being a soldier, and you have experience soldiering. That's not going to come into play until after they see the performances mm-hmm. between across the board. You know what I mean? It's just not. And and we do ourselves a discredit uh, going in. And a lot of times, uh, um, you know, we, we have this expectation that, you know, we have an edge up if we have that. You know, those are those are afterthoughts. Uh, it has been my experiences. Yeah. You know, if you can bring, if you have the chops to bring it into the table, don't leverage, don't try to leverage your, your veteran history to, in, in expecting that you're going to get an acting job from that because uh, it simply has not been my experience that that's the case in most instances. Okay. Yeah. Um, they want to see that you can act, you know, so approach it like an actor. Do you think it's more difficult to train a, veteran to be an actor or for an actor to be a veteran because i know you, you did do it you did direct a short where you did direct an actor to be a veteran uh well actually that that uh, my short you saw my short i did see your short yeah okay well that that actor was a veteran oh there okay there you go never mind um <laughs> but, but 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 say someone that isn't a veteran what, what, what one do you think what, what one do you what, what one do you think is harder it's been both ways you know, I have ac- veterans that are are very talented at uh, at acting. So, you know, but the first thing I'm considering is they're acting. Like, how much work am I going to have to do as a director on set to bring this person up to speed on, you know, delivering the story I want? I mean, I ha- only have so many minutes in a day, and it's nothing personal. It's just I only have so many minutes in a day, yeah. and I don't I don't want to sp- I want to spend it on choices of good, great, greatest, um, you know, uh, in the, when, in the editing room, yeah. you know, not, not, no, that one's not good. No, 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 no. We went through 13 takes of not good to get one. Okay. Take, you know, and, uh, that's not serving the story. That's not serving anybody that's invested in the story. Um, so those are the things that go into to account. Now, the other way around, you know, I have a guy like Mike Vogel that's, that's, you know, super talented in portraying, you know, soldiering, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, he, know, he studies weapons handling. He's really dedicated, uh, to making sure he honors, uh, men and women that serve, yep. you know? And so he, he, and I've experienced that firsthand that he is one of the rare people that like take it that far down the field that, uh, truly, um, you know, yearn to be able to portray that type of thing in the most accurate way possible. And he was very amenable to any input I had. So when I was working on the brave, so the way that whole thing came down was, and you brought up the tech advising thing as well is, is I initially turned that thing down like three times Mm. and I didn't want to do it. You know, I was like, no, I'm not, not, that's a slippery slope. We're not going down that road. Mm. And I, I was, uh, you know, and I had turned many uh, tech advising jobs down, uh, prior to that, sure. Teaching people how to destroy takes me back down that path. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They were like, just talk to the guy. Uh, and this was Dean George Harris, the showrunner. And I talked to him and I was like, he, he, he convinced me that he wanted to get it right and that he'd allow me to train everybody and, you know, run things on that, in that little sphere, the way that I saw that best served the story. And I was like, 
okay, I'll do the pilot. Let's go do the pilot in Morocco, you know, train the people for four weeks prior to. I really enjoyed it. And uh, they incorporated me at a level that I had. It wasn't just like, yeah, this is the way you should do this. It was, no, the, Mikhail said to do it this way. This is why we're going to do it this way, because we want the thing to look a certain way. And that's why the Brave kind of worked out the way it did uh, as far as, you know, honoring the stories of those men and women uh, as best as we possibly could, uh, while at the end of the day, you know, making a TV show, you know. So, but uh, it wasn't long before, you know, they were starting to uh, groom me for directing and allowing me to direct certain things and, you know, uh, and and training me. Uh, John Terleski in particular was my mentor. Uh, and I got to shadow him a number of times. And on the season finale, I was going to shoot second unit yeah. and get my DGA and all that type of stuff. And then they, you know, they canceled the show, pulled funding and didn't do a second unit. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's like, no, <laughs> no, Mark Hamill at the end of the Empire Strikes Back was so, me. So close. Yeah. So close. So close. Gotcha. <laughs> it's good that you got that. You did get an experience to do that. That's pretty cool. What I did learn though, from the brave is that show up for the tech advising jobs. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because, and that, that was a complete flip of the table because that led to me directing. And so I got approached by, I got approached by Activision, uh, a buddy of mine that, you know, works at Activision, uh, Kevin Hendrickson. He brought me in to talk to the guys about, you know, coming in and, you know, being an advisor for them. And I, I was like, yeah, right, let's uh, take a look at it. That's, I, a, I, that's a unique game. I learned it's an inroads to some other stuff if I, if I just uh, deliver. And sure enough, right after everything started kind of getting in alignment, you know, COVID hit and mm. there was a certain, there was a number of, um, there was a number of issues that uh, they, they faced, you know, with getting the motion capture stuff done. And so you're talking about, you're talking about being a, a motion cap director for, for Call of Duty, right? That's right. That's a unique gig. So you had to during, yeah, you had to do that during COVID. Interesting. What, what yeah. changed there? So we, we basically, the way this happened was there's an independent uh, Rouge uh, mocap. And it's a small little mom and pop, you know, mocap studio that uh, was willing to open up. We developed COVID protocols. Um, I, I have a buddy of mine, a stunt choreographer or a stunt coordinator that has been working in the industry for a long time. He's kind of like a family member. Mm. I, I went up to him. I was like, hey, uh, I see an opportunity here uh, to kind of step in and do this thing for them. Because they couldn't do motion capture because Activision's a big, you know, corporation, and so they shut down their their mocap stages. And yeah. I was like, if I present this, can we do it? And he was like, let me check. And he teed everything up, you know, and he's like, absolutely. And I was like, hey guys, you guys want to? Um, here's what we're offering. You want to check it out? And they're like, are you serious? Well, we're kind of shooting some stuff over here right now. We're using this, you know, this mocap company based in uh norwegian uh, some norwegian based company or something yeah um and uh we'll see let, can you do us a previs and so we could just kind of take a look and see what you guys can do and i was like okay darren we have to do a previs we're going i'm going to direct this previs and we need to like knock this thing out of the park yeah and then we'll be able to eat for the next you know foreseeable future <laughs> roger that so we absolutely crushed it, right? We 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 sent that thing, you know, uh, we 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 shattered the scoreboards, so to speak. How did you how did you do it? I, I, was it remote? Was it like he in one little So computer? no, we went into the motion capture studio and did it. Oh, okay. Got we, it. it was before like anybody had any pro COVID protocols. We yeah. we established we're the ones that like here in the video game like we were before SAG all that type of stuff. And so we went in there, we knocked it out. We, you know, had masks, we were putting on gloves, you know, we were you know, sanitizing, they're using UV light at night on all the equipment and everything and taking temperatures, logging, all these types wow. of things that we, est we established yeah. on our own. Yeah. You know, so um, Activision liked that. And so they were like, what, what are they doing for COVID? And we kept it under like, because there was like a 10 person thing, we kept it under that, you know, our crew was... Our casting crew was under that. And so uh, we kind of became the only game in town for a little while there. Wow. And uh, and we were delivering high quality content, 
you know, stuff they hadn't seen in their game before that they're super excited. I can't wait until you guys see it. <laughs> um, Outstanding. Basically, the uh, quick kill stuff, you know. So yeah. they wanted me, they go, hey, we got this thing where, you know, we do these assassinations in game. Like in war, like in, like in war zone, if you sneak up on a guy. Yeah, where, where the guy's like in the last stand and then like you go up behind him and it performs this animation. Yep, yep. Well, basically, it's a fatality. Like if you play Mortal Kombat, it's the fatalities of Call of Duty, yep, right? Yep, yep. So we came up with like three hundred of those. Nice. And, uh, Jeez. And, and dude, there's there's wait till you see this stuff, man. Oh, You're gonna be like, dude, that's so cool, <laughs> and it is so cool. My team is amazing. Like like the the men and women that um, we've been able to pull in on this thing, you know it's they just delivered through the roof man and they they just made me so damn proud when, and i learned of a very critical eye like i can see when any little things like kind of out of place and i'd bring it up and they'd keep fixing it and so i just kept bringing it up and they'd keep fixing it well guess what just so happens animators absolutely love that oh sure you know so so it kind of set the um, – it, it saves on their work. You know, they get a good choreography with – you know, you know they still have to rebuild stuff and all these types of things. Sure. And, but I've learned so much as a result across the board on that. It's just been uh, an incredibly rewarding experience that continues to get – like uh, we're, we're getting ready to sign the third contract with them now. Well, that's, that's so, so cool that you got, you, got to, you got to direct a lot of that – a lot of those animations because I see them in game all the time. So when I did get to step into that seat, you know, I um, I really found something different than acting. And don't get me wrong, I will always be an actor, and I, I want to act as much as possible. It's yeah. just um, the directorial thing. The acting thing brings about a certain energy, and the directorial thing brings about a certain energy in me as well. And and as a director, I fully experience, you know, the ability. Um, that translates from, you know, what I got to do, uh, you know, leading operations and combat to it's a direct translation to, uh, you know, what I can do in film and television. Like I alluded to before, I was an average SEAL, but, you know, leading troops in combat, I felt like uh, just for me on my internal is I felt like that's where I really excelled. Yeah. And like I was, with, I had this natural kind of flow to it and i could see i was i'm very visual i'm an artist i could see where the different pieces are and how they played with each other and yeah. i can i can articulate all that uh through my communication to the different units that were engaged in x y or z part phase of the operation right and that translates directly to directing right so you have a vision you you have the different units and the camera grips you know, actors, writers, you know, all these different things, all vying for, you know, the same outcome, you know, yeah. working towards an identical mission. And it, it directly translated one to one. Um, and then I have the visual aspect yet again. You know, uh, I've drawn my whole life. Remind me to share some of my artwork with you if you're interested. Sure, absolutely. Um, it's, um, you'll be like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a thing, you know, and I've never been trained in it. I never, I've never been formally trained in art, you know, so interesting. I have buddies now that like, will look at my stuff, give me tips. And like, I got kind of this really cool thing going with one of the art directors from Halo. And uh, he's a really good friend of mine. Fantastic person. Jeremy Cook is his name. And, uh, and he'll get on and he'll like, he'll teach me now, like one-on-one -on -one with like a master, you know, it's like. You're also a tattoo artist as well, right? As far as drawing. Yes, goes. sir. I did. Yes, I did sir. hear that in the in the Vince, in the Vinny Rock podcast that you were on. Did you ever get to ink him? You guys were talking about it on the podcast. Vinny, no, man. Oh, I gotta hit him up, dude. That's right. Be like, hey, dude, come over here and get some slung. And he's gonna hate me for the saying this, but I haven't watched past the pilot of my into MC. Um, but that show is a continuation of the universe Sons of Anarchy. Uh, that the Sons of Anarchy, correct. That Sons of Anarchy started. Um, now you spent time as a featured character on that show for a season, right? Uh, I, I saw the, season two. Yeah, yeah, I saw the video that. The show put up on Facebook, uh, your pep talk, as it were, uh, some pretty some pretty mm -hmm. good positivity there. Um, it looks like you were the main protagonist for season two, right? Uh, for about half a season, how did how did how did you like your character's motivation, the arc, etc.? Uh, to be honest with you, um, it was it, man, that was such a ph phenomenal experience. Um, you know, Elgin, 
the showrunner is a fantastic human. Uh, comes from a um, a uh, you know tumultuous past and is is it a prime example of how one can take those experiences and turn them into um, a creative source and, and he's a really good um, example of that. Uh, he he actually is uh, close friends with Rock uh, Jocko. Okay. Rocco, Jocko, Jocko, okay. uh, and my skipper. So, so it, like I walk into the audition and he goes, so uh, I've never met this guy before. I don't know his background. I don't know he's connected to Jocko or anything like that. Wow. I go in, I do the performance. It's, it's, you know, he goes, let's get the business out of the way first. Go ahead. Whenever you're ready, do your thing. Mm. And, um, and you know, I get done and, and he goes, so you were a seal I hear. And I go, yes, sir. Uh, that's the rumor. And, uh, he's like, so you ever, you know, Jocko, I was like, and I look at him and I'm like, oh, yeah, he was my, you know, commanding officer when I got out. Yeah. Um, and he's like, Jocko's my bro. We go way back. He goes, I had to get the business stuff out of the way, you know, and, but you crushed it. So now we can have the conversation. He goes, uh, and, uh, you know, one thing led to another and this character only, uh, was designed to be two episode thing. You know, oh, wow. up being, uh, you know, stretching to 206, which is great. Mikhail, what's, uh, I know you, I know you have Vital Warrior. Is there another non veteran nonprofit or an individual who you've worked with or you've had experience with who, whom you'd like to mention? Well, yeah, I work with VetNet. Um, I worked with them for, uh, for a number of years, uh, and they're based out of Orange County. And what they do is they help homeless or, or newly home newly homeless or about to be homeless veterans get back into the workforce. They give them skills, Very cool. uh, clothe them, get them, uh, prep them for interviews and these types of things. Very good. Um, Mikkel, what is one thing that you learned during your time in the military that you apply to, that you apply to what you do today? If you were going to name one thing. Hmm. That's a deep question. Um, yeah. How am I going to keep that quick? One of the things that I've learned in the military that I apply to my life every day is that uh, the amount of resistance I feel towards something that I know in my subconscious I'm supposed to do is directly proportional to the importance of me having to do it. Mm. That's about as deep as answer as there was a question. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Is there anything that I may have missed or haven't asked that you think is important to share to someone that's listening? I think that the most important thing to share is that um, there is a reason that you we were giving given our experiences is to drive us towards the realization of experiencing the truth within ourselves so that we can take that truth filter it through those experiences in a creative output that allows us to awaken, uplift, inspire, and uh, reproduce that effect in others. You can get to a place that no matter how horrible the experience, you can start to find the blessing of that experience, even up to and including death of loved ones. My son, my son, very son that I told you I had to step out of the military to, to help yeah. passed away this year uh, at the age of 19. And I see the things I have learned as a result of that pain um, and this practice and, and being able to incorporate and understand and have these experiences in my practice of, of the purpose of his life and how the event that I stepped in to, to, uh, you know, care for him for, yeah. you know, and help him through invariably ended in his death. However, that same event and that whole thing drew me out of a life of darkness. It drew me out of a life of darkness into a realm of creativity that I'm here doing today as a result directly because of those events of his life. And here I get an opportunity to carry that forward, uh, carry that mantle forward um, and, and teach it to others all because of him and those experiences. So it's a great way to honor that man. 
it's it's a it's we can get to that state. We can all get to that state. We just have to be shown the way. And and that's what that's what I endeavor to do in film, television, storytelling, acting, directing, and Vital Warrior.